Some say it's the journey that matters more than the destination. But at Kitty Hawk, we feel that the world is headed to a future of sustainable abundance, one that benefits all citizens of this planet and that getting there faster matters. So we seek to accelerate this journey alongside the mission-driven entrepreneurs who relentlessly work to bring this abundant future into the present. This is what drives us forward and what motivates us every day at Kitty Hawk. We see a horizon of golden possibilities ablaze with technologies that improve lives and protect our planet, securing a better tomorrow for us all. So while we agree on the merits of a joyous and mindful journey, we also feel that when it comes to creating a future laden with the best characteristics of humanity, getting there as quickly as possible matters. Kitty Hawk, take flight. Joining us today for the Kitty Hawk Investor Series is Dr. David Sinclair. Dr. Sinclair is one of the world's renowned experts in longevity. He is a professor in the Department of Genetics and co-director of the Paul F. Glenn Center for Biology of Aging Research at Harvard Medical School. David is perhaps best known for his work on understanding why we age and how to slow its effects. In 1999, he was recruited to Harvard Medical School, where he has been teaching aging biology and translational medicine for aging. His research has been increasingly focused on how to reprogram the body to a younger state. Dr. Sinclair is world-renowned, having appeared in Time Magazine, The New York Times, 60 Minutes, The Washington Post, The Economist, TED, and The Joe Rogan Experience, among many others. Dr. Sinclair is a close confidant of Peter Diamandis, who was our last guest, and has been incredibly generous with his time at Singularity University and with Abundance 360. It is with great gratitude and much respect that I welcome David here today. Good morning, everyone. Uh, David, it is such a great pleasure to have you here. I also want to welcome our uh, LPs, our CEOs of our portfolio companies, our advisors, and, and some uh, close friends of Kitty Hawk. Uh, I'd like to remind you to keep your, your monitors on. It's great to have your cameras on. It's really great to be able to, to see you and engage with you. Uh, also a reminder, we're going to be doing about 30 minutes of fireside, and then we'll open it up to, to questions. So a really great opportunity today to hear from one of the world's you know absolutely uh, leading edge and most renowned thinkers on longevity. And, and so start thinking about uh, some great questions that uh, you'd like to ask him. So with that, uh, let's dive in. Uh, David, really such a treat to see you again. Very grateful for your time and uh, personally just, you know, very excited about the opportunity to, to chat with you and, and to learn with you. And I know we've got a, a lot of folks uh, listening in, which uh, tells us a lot about the, uh, the interest and excitement around the work that you're doing and around longevity. So uh, first of all, thank you very much for being here. Well, thanks, Will. Uh, it's great to be here and I look forward to this discussion. Thank you. So I thought we might just start off with a, a very high level kind of framing question on, you know, what is aging? Why why do we age and kind of what's the, the latest thinking and, and understanding about that? Yeah, well, we've had a revolution in our understanding of how to control aging and also why we age in the first place. It's as revolutionary as the first flight discovery of antibiotics. And it's just happened in the last 10 or so years and is accelerating. Uh, we've gone from learning how to build a glider and we're actually now building planes and we can envisage a Concorde jet uh, down the line, hopefully within our lifetimes. Um, so let's first of all, quickly just get to why we age. Uh, probably if you ask most people, they say, oh, things get broken, things get damaged, free radicals, DNA damage. It's all true, that stuff happens, but really the, the revolution has been in the understanding of that that's not the main reason we age. The reason we age, it's a loss of information in the body, not the genetic information, which is in our DNA. That's a very easy piece of information to maintain. DNA is digital, so digital information is easy. It's the analog part of the body's information called the epigenome that is disrupted over time. Um, and so we can actually, in my lab, make animals age faster by disrupting their epigenome. So what's the epigenome? Just briefly, it's, it's the control systems that read the DNA. And when we're developing as uh, you know, in, in, in the womb and we are born and we develop, it's this epigenome that is established that tells our cells how to work efficiently. And remember, every cell in the body 
almost every cell in the body has the same DNA. What makes those cells work differently, function differently, and stay in that identity over decades is the epigenome. And essentially, it's just chemicals on the DNA that fold the DNA into three-dimensional structures. That's what it is. But over time, we see that those structures break down. The cells lose their ability to read the right genes at the right time. Cells forget how to function. Nerve cells become more like skin cells. Skin cells can start to look like kidney cells. And that's, that's aging. And that is 80 to 90, 90% of all the illnesses on the planet. Um, infectious diseases, even as we know, will attack people as they get older. So this is the major cause of death and disability in the world right now. And the problem is that very few people even understand that, let alone work on that. And then finally, the, the real breakthrough has been, we published a little over a year ago, that we could safely reset the epigenetic information back to a younger age, a permanent reset. And so we used mice in that case, and we could reset the age of a mouse safely. We could reestablish its vision by treating the eye, making the eye younger. And, uh, and so that breakthrough is, has led to more than $3 billion of investment in this space just in the past 12 months to be able to reverse the aging process. But there are also things we can do in our daily lives that we'll get to that can slow down the aging process and even reverse aspects of it right now. Terrific. So, so maybe that's a nice uh, segue to talk a little bit about some of the work uh, that you're doing and and your focus on sirtuins and uh, what you've discovered about the Yamanaka factors and and how you are able to, uh, I believe, my understanding is to reverse the aging as well as kind of slow down aging and love to understand kind of the the broader implications on uh, the transition from uh, from uh, mice and and rodents into uh, into mammals and, and kind of what you're seeing there and, and timelines. Yeah, well, things are moving very very quickly. It's making my head spin. Um, I believe it. Yeah, experiments that that used to take well a year. You can do a million of them in a day now. It's you know instead of a billion dollars, it costs a hundred dollars. And what just quickly, what what is driving that acceleration? Is that just computation or uh, sequencing? Uh, what what you know what exponential uh, technology is uh, is driving that? Yeah, um, well, yeah, everything was was bespoke and hand hand done uh, during my PhD years, nineteen nineties, and then uh, the two thousands we had sequencing, uh, but it was still expensive. Sequencing the, the genome was hundreds of millions of dollars um, and took years. And now it can be done um, you know, for hundred dollars on a, on a little thing that's the size of a chocolate bar uh, on a laptop by a high school student. So what drove that is uh, really the, the ability to miniaturize the machines that read DNA and, uh, and parallel process those. And it was mostly done initially by microscopy to look at colors that change on a, on a chip and the DNA was being read. And that, that's actually old technology. That's by Illumina. Um, the more uh, advanced uh, upcoming technologies, such as Oxford Nanopore, actually bring the DNA through a pore and electrical uh, pulses, or at least the, the conductance through that pore, tells you the DNA. And they can read, um, instead of a few hundred letters on the DNA, you, they can read thousands, sometimes tens of thousands. So that, that was the genomics revolution. But... And that's driving a lot of it. But what's really the, where the innovation lies right now is to how to use those machines to read the epigenome. And we couldn't read the epigenome very well even a few years ago, but there are companies such as Dovetail Genomics, which is the leading epigenetics company in full disclosure. I'm um, a, a small owner of that company. They, are, um, they develop technologies to read the three-dimensional structure of the genome. And that's now becoming very cheap and mainstream as well. And that's opening up new areas of understanding our biological age, but also in cancer, often just reading the DNA sequence isn't sufficient to understand how to kill that, that tumor. Um, but you also need to address the epigenome as well. And there are drugs that are being developed to be able to do that. Great. And so uh, it, this technology is accelerating uh, your ability to kind of understand. And, and are you creating... Is it new molecules that, that you're creating basically to, to help drive some of these things? Are you, you know, uh, doing kind of CRISPR type technologies to change sequences and, and kind of get new results? Or how does it actually manifest itself in terms of uh, tools and, and technologies to reverse yeah, that's such a great question. Uh, so the miniaturization is already there. So where the innovation now, it's using life to understand life. So there are enzymes that are out there that we 
are only just discovering that do do real interesting tricks in the cell. So CRISPR is a good example of an enzyme that is an, uses an RNA to direct an enzyme that then cleaves DNA or can be used to direct enzymes or, or even um, other editing enzymes into specific places on the genome, which is a, a six foot long chemical. And we can now basically insert or change pieces of the genome very accurately in the dish, but also now in patients. Now that that is a, is a huge advance, be able to, to target changes in the genome, but we're also figuring out ways to insert specific barcodes, uh, we can use what are called transposons, which are just natural uh, viruses, uh, kind of um, genetic uh, elements that like to do certain tricks. So for example, I'll give, I'll give something tangible that, that may help. Uh, in my lab, we want to make the test for biological age cheaper. The way we currently do that is we have to sequence the entire genome and look at where the chemicals that are added to the DNA sit. The chemicals that are important for aging uh, one of them is called um, a methyl, and it's called DNA methylation. And you can read that, but you you have to do somebody's samples individually, okay? And so the, the tests now run hundreds of dollars. And but you know you get a, a biological age test, you get a number, and it, you can predict when you're going to die, and you can monitor whether your supplements, or your diet, or your drugs are actually helping to slow or reverse your age, your your true age, not your birth, birthday candles. And you, you now, have that, a high degree of confidence in in that that number. You know, it seems to be accurate and and pretty trustworthy at this well, point. Well, it's still, well, it's still early days. We, it's early. There are lots of different clocks. There's probably twenty of them now. It's unclear which is the best one, and they tell you different things. One can tell you more accurately the health of your your liver or your spleen mm. or your blood. There isn't one clock to rule them all yet, but we will get there as well. Um, and part of the other issue is that. The algorithms are based on small numbers of people currently, um, thousands. Once millions of people have taken these tests, it'll be clearer. But right now, they're accurate to predict your longevity within 5% error um, and even your future health. Um, but the good news is that we actually know that 80% um, of your longevity is based on your epigenome and your how you live your life. So that even when you get one of these numbers, it's not a, it's not a, a straight line unless you continue on your path, you can actually change the trajectory and slow down aging. Um, so the, the test that we um, we wanted to build was to make it cheaper. And how do you do that? You multiplex, you run thousands and eventually millions of samples in one sequencing run. So what would take $100, $200 can now be you know, for a cent. And we've managed to do that uh, using one of these, um, these transposons that inserts a barcode, which is just a, a small sequence of letters of DNA into the regions that we want to read. So that does two things. We only read the parts that we want, so it doesn't cost extra money. We don't waste our, our time and, and, uh, and reagents. And then the other thing that happens that's interesting is if you have a barcode of a little sequence that's unique to that patient or that sample, you can mix a thousand patients together, run them all together, and then use a computer to figure out which data belongs to which sample wow. called deep evolution. And we've, we're, we're in the process of commercializing that as well. So that this test will be so cheap, it'll actually be less than the cost of actually shipping the, the cheek swab. Yeah, it, it really is amazing. So many of these um, improvements, and when we were on the uh, the longevity learning trip with uh, Peter and Fall and got to spend some time with you, uh, it was just really, you know, so extraordinary to hear about all the different um, advancements that people are working on. And it feels like, and you know, we've been hearing about longevity and breakthroughs for a long time, but it, it feels like some of these things are really starting to to be within our, our reach and treatments that we may be able to see uh, in the not too distant future. Uh, be, be very curious as to you know, where you are in terms of your own research and, and again, kind of moving that into, into human trials and, and what we might kind of anticipate in terms of uh, timing around people being able to access some of these treatments, maybe initially abroad and, and then eventually in the US. Yeah. Well, that's the exciting thing. When I started in this field, I thought it was research that was going to benefit the next few generations, not this one. But it looks like things may actually be, be here uh, now and within our, many of our lifetimes. Not just slowing aging, but actually reversing it. And all you need to do is reverse your age by one year every year, and things get pretty interesting. And I really think that that's going to be doable. There's already reports. I one of one of my doctors that I work with 
um, that epigenetic test I just described, the DNA methylation test, he's reversed his age, at least of his blood, by 18 years in the last 18 months. And there are lots of reports now of people doing that. There's a couple of published studies that look believable, though it's early days. So we're actually in a world now where um, I think within the next few years, we'll have confirmation that if you do this or that, whether and I'll, I'll describe what these are, um, you will actually not just slow down aging, but reverse it in certain organs and tissues. And then what I described about truly resetting the body, which we did in mice, uh, that technology is now um, spun out. It was spun out in 2017 into a company called Life Biosciences, and they are in non-human primates now. So macaque monkeys are being treated with the gene therapy to reverse aging of their eyes. Um, and if all goes well for safety, um, then we're going to next year try our first human patient to see if we can cure their blindness. So this is moving really rapidly. So what can you do right now, though, before these actually make it to the market? Uh, well, there are things you can do. Um, if you've read Lifespan, my book, you'll know on page 304, I list out what I was doing in 2019. I'd largely do all of that still. I've just added some bells and whistles to that and some new things. But there are there are things there are, that I would categorize them as diet, supplements, and drugs. And uh, I, I guess lifestyle, you, you would include sleep and exercise and mental health as well. That's important too. So in the book, I go through all of that. There's not enough time to go through it. So I do recommend if you haven't read the book to, to go there for an initial source of information. Uh, but the cheat sheet is basically that the supplements are uh, one that I take daily is called NMN, which is, you know, it's splashed all over the internet. If you Google me, uh, it's it raises NAD levels, which activate these sirtuins you mentioned, Will. Sirtuins stabilize the epigenome, uh, and we actually think slow down that process of aging very well. And in animal studies and humans, we've shown that you can greatly improve the health and resilience of tissues and, and even uh, prevent diseases from cardiovascular disease to even muscle wasting. We have clinical trial data that isn't published that I'll share with you just within this group that uh, positive results in humans using NMN to, will actually boost muscle strength in, in people that are um, over, over midlife. Um, so that, that's NMN. Can I ask you a real question, real quickly on on uh, the topic of NMN? I mean, I know there's there's a lot of controversy around NMN and NAD plus, and what are the right ways to to get this into your body? And um, would you mind just really quickly kind of touching on the different uh, thinking and and your belief around you know NMN as being kind of the right path? And uh... sure. Well, I don't sell anything, by the way, so I have nothing to gain by. Just yeah. go, what I say, which is important. Um, contro controversy, yeah, don't believe people who sell products or who want to become famous. I'm not doing either of those. So, you know, that's one way to weed out what's real and what isn't. The other is just look at the scientific literature. Um, and my book is fully referenced. Um, so the, the, I don't care whether it's NMN or it's, there's another one called NR. But what I do know is data, and I know how to read data, I know how to do studies, I know how to do that. So what um, so be, first of all, be careful. The controversy is self-serving, right? That's step one. Okay. Um, and I don't engage in it for obvious reasons. Um, and there are even professors that are making a lot of money by selling products on the internet. Um, I won't name them. The, so NMN has emerged from our studies, both in mice and in humans, to be able to raise NAD levels better than the other molecules that are out there certainly much better than niacin or nicotinamide, which is vitamin B3. This is much better than that because it's got other components in the molecule, not just vitamin B3 or niacin, but it's also got a phosphate in there. It's also got a ribose, which is a sugar, that all three are needed for the body to make NAD. And we see this in these studies that it raises NAD better, much higher levels. Um, you can even go three to five fold higher than normal levels um, over baseline by taking a gram or in, in this case, two grams of NMN every day, uh, which is what, what I do. Um, one of the controversies is, does NMN get into the body? Well, you know, I've been studying this in humans for the last few years. It's been done at Harvard through uh, a collaborator, Shelley uh, Basin, who's a world leader, um, and he's got that data. So, you know, there's a lot of data that hasn't been published. Um, the paper just came out. I recommend that you look at it, or everyone here, um, Google's uh, Basin B. H-A-S-I-N, he's at Harvard, and he published a paper that shows that NMN raises NAD levels effectively in people. Great, um, thank that, you. That, that's the guide. You know, yeah. everyone has questions, unfortunately, Will, I could talk for an hour about, but I'll try to be short. Yeah, 
No, no, I, I really appreciate that. Okay, so um, we were talking about you know different ways that I mean. My biggest takeaway so far is, uh, you know, one, to be very, very excited about all the progress that's taking place. Two, a huge amount of our longevity and our health span is really within our control. And so changing your lifestyle through uh, diet and supplementation and exercise and sleep. And we were, I think, starting to talk about some of the supplementation. Um, certainly would love to talk about diet uh, as well. But on the supplementation front, um, NMN is an important thing. Are there other things that you're uh, taking or, or the data is really encouraging and, and people should be aware about? Yeah, so I've, I've been taking resveratrol for about 15 years now. That was the red wine story that went around the world and increased red wine sales 30%. That, that one's a good one, but you have to know that you can't just swallow it with water. It'll, it needs to be dissolved, pre-dissolved preferably in yogurt or olive oil, something oily, or proteinaceous, lots of protein in it. Does that mean um, you can take them both at the same time? Like, could I take yogurt and take resveratrol or do I need to actually mix it in with olive oil and yogurt and then consume? It's better to mix it beforehand. Okay. Um, I, I don't have clinical trials head to head to answer that question, but yep. I just know that it does work if you pre-mix it. Um, and that's what I do. Great. Um, olive oil has its other benefits as well. It's been shown also to contain, it does contain oleic acid. Um, avocados do as well. And it actually activates SIR1, which is what we're trying to do with SIR2 and one of the main sort of So the combination of NMN resveratrol and this oleic acid from olive oil is a triple combo designed to slow down the aging process through activation of the sort of The other third thing that I take um, probably every third day uh, is metformin, which is a drug for type two diabetes, but increasingly shown in thousands of people that people who take metformin are healthier and have less disease than people who don't even have type two diabetes. And so what that tells us is that it's likely to have benefits beyond type 2 diabetes. And those people are similarly protected against cancer, heart disease, Alzheimer's, and frailty. So I take it as a preventative measure, not just for blood glucose levels and type 2 diabetes, but for these other diseases. But that requires, at least in the US and other Western countries, uh, a prescription. But you can get those online increasingly. There are companies that you don't have to even go and see a physician to get a prescription. And David, I, I want to touch on one thing. You, you mentioned every third day for for metformin, uh, and I've you know we talked uh, previously about pulsing and the importance of of that. Maybe you could just kind of highlight you know what that is and and why you recommend that in terms of uh, you know most supplementation and and I think maybe even beyond that. Yeah. Well, I know my body really well now. Um, Fifty almost 53 now, so I've been doing this. And well, I, I can get to the point where I, I know when my body needs it, wants it, uh, will respond to it, or won't respond to it. And the considerations for metformin are, are mainly twofold. One is um, that it, it does block mitochondrial activity temporarily. So if you want to really work out hard at the gym, uh, you don't want to take it uh, the night before. And I do that. But I also, I'm one of the people, the 30% of people that are very sensitive to metformin. Uh, my stomach doesn't feel great when I swallow it. Um, and so I, if I'm having a day where I'm not feeling great or I can tell that my, my body's going to be sensitive to it, I might skip that day as well. So it's, it's, I'm not taking it every day, basically. Um, but that, that's really it. Um, pulsing is important, though, when it comes to supplements. I, I found in my research that giving the body a rest uh, can be beneficial. I'll give you one example, um, resveratrol, if it's given um, every other day to a mouse, actually extends its lifespan better than if it's given every day. And so when I, I do take resveratrol every day, but there are, I do give my body uh, rest periods. Mm. Uh, one, you know, I'll I tell you what, I, I'm not a perfect uh, uh, role model. I do occasionally don't sleep, and I also occasionally forget to take supplements, especially when I travel. And so I, I don't worry when I forget to take my supplements because the data says it's okay to give the body a rest once in a while. Gotcha. Yeah, I appreciate it. And I have to say, every time I, I see you, you seem to look uh, more and more fit and younger and younger. So uh, whatever you're doing seems to seems to be working. Um, I, you know, I think people would also be interested to learn a little bit about uh, diet. You've got kind of a, a pretty unusual diet, although kind of increasing data seems to seems to support, um, you know, intermittent fasting. And maybe we can talk a little bit about that and also the the type of foods, because I think it's, you know, interesting the the uh, your thoughts on kind of, you know, stressed vegetables or plants as opposed to, um, you know, non organic and, and the benefits that come from that to the body. Yeah. 
Right. So when we first discovered resveratrol, uh, we, this was 2003, we also found another 20 molecules and published those. They didn't get as much attention, though. They're coming back into fashion now. Uh, molecules like physetin and quercetin, which you'll, you can find in my book or Google them. They're multi-beneficial. Uh, but yeah, so that what we had to explain was why are so many plant molecules beneficial for health? And why do they hit just the right pathways in the body, the right enzymes to make the body healthy? And it cannot be a coincidence. This is it's just beyond possibility. So what we came up with, uh, and by we, I mean Conrad Howitz was my collaborator. And we came up with this idea called xenohormesis, which is the idea that, so xeno means from other species or plants in this case. And hormesis is the idea that a little bit of stress is good for you. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And by stress, I don't mean mental stress, I mean biological stress, adversity. So what we found actually, and this is now largely established, is that when plants are under adversity, they make these molecules like resveratrol, physine, quercetin, And that by ingesting those stressed out plants, our body actually responds favorably. We get the health benefits of, uh, of ingesting those. Why? Probably because the body is sensing that the food supply might run out and is hunkering down and defending and becoming more resilient. We call these molecules adversity mimetics or xenohermetins, as I mentioned. And so how do you do that? Well, you look for plants that are full of red, blue, uh, dark green, organic foods that haven't been treated very nicely are the best to look for. And color represents typically a stressed out uh, plant. Hmm. And a good example is red wine. You know. It's, it's known that if you stress out the grapes, you get better wine. Part of the reason is that these molecules are made by the plants that not just taste good, but they're also good for you. Amazing. Um, not non-intuitive uh, for sure. And, and really, really helpful. Um, what, you know, what, uh, I guess I'd love to get your, your thoughts on um, hormone supplementation as well. There seems to be increasing kind of uh, excitement and lots of companies spooling up to focus on uh, on hormone replacement therapy or supplementation. And uh, are you a believer in that in terms of kind of benefits to the body and uh, lifespan and health span? Yeah, well, so I, I've been able to um, avoid having to supplement myself uh, with hormones. Um, it's a different question about female hormone replacement therapy. There, it's very, it's impossible to do that naturally. So, you know, there's two categories. There's pre-menopause and men, and then there's post-menopause. I'm, I'm in favor of supplementing hormones at the body's correct levels, which should be specific for you. So if you're pre-menopausal and you're a female, I would say get a baseline of, and over a number of years with your doctor, know what's good for you so that if later you want to supplement and maintain your regular levels, you can do that. Because there's a lot of evidence that, that maintaining levels post-menopause uh, are beneficial for long-term health. Um, and so I've talked to many experts about that. So talk to your doctor. But what I think also you're asking is what about people who are, not, who, you know, are losing testosterone? Um, a lot of men lose testosterone and muscle mass so, as they age. Um, I've found ways to maintain and even boost levels of hormones naturally. So there are exercises you can do. Um, I'll give you one example. So testosterone, uh, build up the big muscles in your body, your quads, your back muscles, hip hinge exercises, deadlifts. I do all of those. I got my testosterone levels up from a pretty paltry 400, 500. Um, I got it up to 700 doing that. Then NMN boosted it even more. So I got up to about 900. And then uh, um, I did get a girlfriend. So that that helped. But but also what happened was um, Tonkat Ali is a supplement that's been clinically shown to raise testosterone levels. It's T-O-N-G-K-A-T space A-L-I. Um, and I took that. And actually what happened, I will admit publicly here, that uh, my testosterone levels went uh, beyond what I was comfortable with. And mm -hmm. I was starting to feel um, emotionally uh, as though I had very high levels of testosterone, kind of like a teenager again. And so I, I backed up on that. So the, the point here is that there are natural ways that you can boost hormones. And, and with the case of testosterone, um, there's some, um, some evidence that you can, your body can become quote unquote addicted to the supplement to, replacement and it's it's hard to get your testes to make natural testosterone if it's been uh, you know had a crutch um growth hormone um i don't think long term that's going to be good for health i do think all of these hormones can be beneficial in the short run you will feel better you'll build muscle you'll have 
probably more energy. But long term, the science doesn't um, bear that out that it's going to be uh, slowing down aging. If anything, it'll speed up aging. And so I prefer to mimic an adversity in life rather than mimic an abundance, which is what testosterone and, uh, and growth hormone um, injections would do. And the, the intermittent fasting certainly certainly speaks to that, right? Kind of stressing your body and, and you're on a, you eat, I believe, one meal uh, every 24 hours, a, a dinner, is that right? Yeah, yeah, I wanted to just speak about that. Um, so I, I've skipped breakfast most of my life. Um, you know, a little nibble of yogurt in the morning is not going to hurt a couple of teaspoons. I'm still fasting. I still have ketosis going on, which you can measure. Um, but yeah, I, I, I've changed my diet over the years. I, I was on a an Okinawan diet, which was mainly um, uh, fish and, and more like a, a, a pescatarian diet. And I, I actually do experiment on my, on my body. So I change things, I measure them, and I I'm, regard myself as a as a test bed for others. And what's worked the best for me is what I'm on right now. I've never been healthier. My biological age is about maximum what has been seen in these tests back more than a, a decade. And the trick has been, and I, I want to give give praise to someone who put me on this diet. Um, Serena Poon, uh, she's a nutritionist who I've come to, to regard as a friend and a colleague. Serena Poon had said, you should look into the literature on vegetarianism and veganism. And I thought, you know, come on, meat tastes too good. I'm not going to give it up. And um, so I, I'm now on a, on a lifestyle where I love what I eat. I'm eating one main meal a day. Occasionally I have lunch, um, maybe once a week, twice a week. I do eat nuts and a bit of chocolate during the day when I feel peckish and I want a little bit of a brain boost. But I do try not to eat any large meals during the day and make my glucose spike, which I also measure with a, a monitor here so I know what's going on in my body. And the benefits have been just dramatic. I'm, I'm on a vegan diet generally. I, I'm, I'm a struggling vegan, um, but I don't eat a lot of meat very, very, very rarely. And I, I also gave up alcohol which has been quite the thing, you know, every, you know, I'm not hard and fast about this. If I'm not giving up all meat and I'm not giving up all alcohol, you know, if I'm feeling like I want it, I'll, I'll give it to my body, but I've trained my body now to be um, actually not crave anything. And I actually look forward to having a, a vegan meal. So what's a vegan meal? You know, re there's fantastic vegan restaurants. It's not salads. It's actually really tasty hamburgers and that kind of stuff. Um, but the benefits have been dramatic. My cholesterol levels, my, my testosterone's gone up, cholesterol's gone down, blood glucose, glucose levels are great. And when I compare those levels of my blood work, I, I use a company called Inside Tracker with clients. Um, and um, I, again, I mean, I'm, I'm an advisor to that company. They measure uh, 40 analytes. And if I, measure, if I look at my analytes and my blood biochemistry versus men of my age um, and younger, I'm actually better than, a lot, than, than most 20 year olds. And so I think that bodes well oh. for a couple of things, my longevity, but I'm doing this not for my longevity. It's to actually learn and educate others. And I think that as a role model, I can do that. Amazing. So David, I want to ask you, is there anything, you know, we haven't touched on that you are, you know, uh, incredibly excited about emerging, focusing more energy on, we haven't touched on that you think would be, you know, something important and beneficial for folks to, to hear about. Yeah. So we, we've touched on a lot of good things. Let's just recap the supplements, the drugs, the exercise. You definitely need to lose your breath uh, three times a week. If you can, you don't need, you only need to do it for 10 minutes a session. You don't need to run marathons. That's been shown. Um, I definitely am I'm, I'm not great at that. I, I'm working too hard, but that's what the science says. And if you can't do that, uh, do 10,000 steps. Um, 12 is about the maximum that you need to do. You don't get additional benefits beyond 12,000 steps. But if, but just move, get up out of your chair, get a standing desk. These are all good things. The other thing that I'm, I'm getting more and more into is mental health um, and sleep. Uh, I have a bed that adjusts the temperature uh, and I get deep sleep. I can get away now with four or five hours of sleep. And that's also partly due, I believe, to adopting meditation. I'm, I'm a novice at it, but I do meditate before sleep for about 20 minutes. Um, I use a machine that flashes lights into my eyes that helps me get into a, a state of relaxation. I, I found that what used to be a lack of sleep, five hours, four hours, I couldn't think during the day, uh, is fairly routine for me and I don't need more than that. And my health is great. 
So that's uh, that's been new for me, but I think is a really important area for people to focus on because being stressed out, getting a lack of sleep um, definitely will age you as well. Awesome. Thank you for that. So we're going to do our six quick hits to kind of finish this piece off and then uh, and then move into general uh, Q&A with, uh, with our attendees here. So uh, real quickly, best film or series you watched during the pandemic? Uh, well, you know, I, I needed a laugh during the pandemic. And so I uh, ended up watching uh, Death to 2020. And uh, yeah, I haven't laughed so hard in a long time. So that was that was what I very much enjoyed during the pandemic. Awesome. How about a recent book that had an impact on you? Um, I read the biography of Hamilton uh, by Ron Chernow, and that was inspirational to see how somebody from nothing could become a world figure and, and really change the world. Um, I'm reading a lot of books about um, uh, learning to be a better person, and uh, you are not your ego is one of those. I'm learning that destroying my ego is something I needed to do, even though I thought I was a humble person. And again, that, that is uh, Serena Poon is an inspiration on that. Um, so a lot of these uh, mental self-help books and becoming better uh, are good. And one other book I, I want to mention is, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, Why Women Have Sex was super interesting. And this is mainly for men to read. It mm. gave me insights into the, into the female mind that I didn't understand at all. I don't have any sisters. And I've always been fascinated at the differences between males and females. There are a lot of similarities, of course, but we, you know, we, we differ by a whole chromosome. And so trying to understand that has been very helpful, um, not, not just in business, but in daily life. Great. Thank you. Uh, how about things that make you optimistic about the future? Um, well, you know, my, my first answer would have been my Tesla. I've driven Teslas for many years. And when I first got into a Tesla, I thought, okay, here is the future. I'm, I'm not so worried about the planet now. If this can be done, if you can drive an electric vehicle like this that's faster and a better car than anything I've ever driven, you know, I think humans can achieve anything. So that's a, the beacon of hope. But I also, as I thought about it, I wanted to say something more original. And what really has changed my view is the ability um, and increasing acceptance of scientists stepping up into the public arena and speaking directly to the public. And you know, I know it sounds a little bit self-serving but it, it, it's something i've thought a lot about because i have my own podcast but that's not the reason i mention it people like andrew huberman um, are paving the way for the public to have direct access to professors and not have it filtered through newspapers which was the old days which was a disaster because newspapers they were more about you know readership than the truth and now um, people can have for free an education like phd um, and there's so much information out there and that to me is important because this 99% of what's out there on the internet, which we've touched on in, even in my field, um, people, the average person cannot read scientific papers, doesn't know how to interpret the data, doesn't have access to libraries, doesn't have the education. And how are they supposed to know what's real and what isn't? And looking at Amazon reviews for supplements, for example, is no guide. And so I think what's really great in any field, whether it's physics or medicine, uh, mental health that scientists are finally able to maintain their careers while also being great public communicators. Amazing. Uh, yeah, it is an extraordinary time if you are a lifelong learner, right? The data that's out there. And yeah, Andrew's a friend and a huge, huge fan of uh, his work and love the, the podcast that you two did together. Um, I think with that, uh, let's transition into some Q&A and, and welcome in some of the amazing folks we have uh, joining us today. I think uh, Mary Lou Jebson uh, has a question for us and maybe we'll we'll kick off with Mary Lou. Hey, yeah, thanks. Um, can you hear me? We can. Yeah. So thank you, loved your book. Um, question about Met Metforum and the recent paper that was um, came out from Denmark saying birth defects caused by males taking. So what's your take on that? I know it was picked up pretty widely. It was only one paper, but curious. Yeah. Um, so it went from, uh, what was it? It was, was it 0.3%, um, 0.4%, something like that. It, it went up. It was statistically significant. And any anything to do with both defects, you cannot take lightly. Um, I just wanted to put it into context when you look at the numbers. It's not a dramatic increase because these are small numbers to begin with. Uh, but nevertheless, it looks like it's it, it could be significant. Now, 
what I would say is that if you if a male wants to conceive in an abundance of caution uh, for the, at least three months before conceiving, uh, you'd want to go off metformin. Um, but still, the risks are extremely low whether you're on metformin or you're not on metformin. Um, and I think most people know when they're going to conceive and, and can adapt their lifestyle accordingly. Um, and often men who are on metformin are you know, beyond years of when they want to be having children anyway. But it's an important point, that uh, another data point, that, we, that no drug is perfectly safe um, and that we need to be aware of the risks. Great. Thank you. Um, we had a quick question from uh, Jeff George uh, asking if there was any brand of NMN that you particularly recommended and, and again, confirming that it was two grams a day was the suggested uh, dosage. Um, well, yeah, a lot of, um, I need to do a little bit of correction. Um, I don't suggest things or recommend them. Um, I talk about the data, so that's okay. clarification of the formal one. Um, and I, you know, I'm professor at Harvard, I have to have a disclaimer, I'm not a physician and I, I don't do uh, medical recommendations. There's that. Um, the, the products, I, I would love to help. I am working on something that will be commercial um, that goes along with the, the cheek swab test for biological age. But until that's commercialized, which is probably towards the end of this year, uh, what I can say is that, uh, that you want to look for products that have ultra pure uh, ingredients, so greater than 98% pure. That's true for any supplement, including NMN. You want it to be white and fluffy. It shouldn't be anything but white. Um, and it should taste a little bit like burnt popcorn. And um, you also want to look for the letters GMP, which uh, is a, a standard practice for um, supplement companies that you want to, it's a seal of approval. They're using good manufacturing practices. Um, is it two grams? Um, two grams is at the high end. Um, I rarely take two grams because my testosterone went too high. So I'm now down below one gram. Um, I, I would say that the data is a rec is not a recommendation. The data says that 500 milligrams would be a low dose and one gram would be uh, an average dose. Um, the two grams is more, was more for uh, looking uh, at the high end. And, uh, and what I can tell you that is out there now is that if you take a gram of NMN orally every day, you just swallow that with some water, uh, you'll, on average, you'll roughly double your NAD levels. Why is that number important? Because uh, someone my age in their 50s, early 50s, will have half the levels of NAD uh, than they had when they were in their 20s based on skin measurements. And so what we're trying to do at a minimum is to maintain those youthful levels so that the sirtuins can do their protective work on the on the epigenome and uh and on organs and boost longevity that way. Great. Thank you. Um, Aaron Lee Zucker has a question. Aaron, great to have you joining us. Yeah, thanks so much for inviting me, Will. And uh, really, really, really appreciate you being here, Dr. Sinclair. Um, so I have, I have two questions I'll just tee up. Um, and the first is, uh, I'm building a company that's focused on helping a person figure out their, um, their perfect health routine. Um, so testing every single thing they're doing, assessing the effect of it, and then personalizing it to maximize effect and minimize unwanted side effects. And so my question is, what are the limits of potential for lifestyle change with respect to longevity? How far do we go before we have to get into Yamanaka factors and other pharmaceutical interventions? And the second question, I'll just maybe reformat the way I stated it. What is the most sensitive, cheapest optimization biometric that people can track, right? Whether, whether digital or wet lab or any other sort of indicator, what can people to help titrate the effect of what they're doing. Right. Uh, well, to the first question, um, it doesn't appear that we can get beyond 120 or so uh, without something more uh, technologically advanced than lifestyle. Um, that's the maximum known human lifespan. Um, I do think that by living the right way, uh, in the way that you're suggesting, and the way that I'm living my lifestyle, um, can you know, increase the odds better than 50-50 of making it to 100. Um, and that's based on data. It's also based on what I see in, in clients of mine, in my family. My father is 82 without any aches, pains, or decline since he was in his 50s. And he's doing uh, what I, you know, my, my regimen. Uh, Yamanaka factors, I don't see why 
using that approach to reset the body. And whether it's Yamanaka factors or a pill one day, um, why we couldn't get beyond 120. Um, I don't put limits on human longevity. There is no law that says we have to age. There's no maximum. It's, it's not like we'll get to 150 and the body says, all right, I'm done. Um, I think it's unlimited. Now, do we have the technology to get to 1,000 yet? No. But do we have the technology to reverse the age of the body one year every year? Yeah, I think we, we probably have that technology uh, or, or pretty soon. Um, and the surprising thing in our work was so far how safe it is. You would think that reversing the age of the body might cause cancer. It doesn't in the way that we do it. Um, so that that's uh, first question. The second is what's the best metric? Um, blood glucose levels and HbA1c, which is a measure of about a month of, of blood glucose levels, is is a great one. Uh, inflammatory markers are important. You want those to be really low, especially cardiovascular inflammatory, such as CRP, which is known to influence longevity. Um, and of course, you know, your cholesterol and markers of cholesterol, including LP little a, which is one that's not re readily measured, but that's important for cardiovascular health. Um, hormone levels are, are indicative of longevity. So I mentioned testosterone, that's a, a good indicator. Um, those are the main ones that, that I use. There are some ones that you might not realize, such as albumin, which tracks very well with longevity uh, and is a sign of protein turnover and high albumin levels track with, uh, with longevity. Um, and so that's one of those uh, ones that I include in, in my panel tests. Great. Thank you. Great questions. Um, how about uh, Brad Palmer next? Uh, hi, Will. Thank you. And hi, David, good to, good to see you again. This is terrific. Thanks for doing this. Um, <clears throat> I was on a um, kind of epic expedition where I got to go to uh, Antarctica a week ago. And uh, on the boat were a lot of epic people, and there were two longevity doctors. <clears throat> Um, one of them I spent some time with, and he recommended for me peptide shots. In addition to the things you've talked about, um, peptide shots that I would self-administer, exosome shots with less frequency, and even once a year stem cell shots. Um, I wonder what you think about those three things. I'm in good health. My biological age is quite a bit lower than my chronological age so far. <laughs> Great. Yeah, that's that's what I like to hear. Yeah, there, there are more advanced things and, and less proven things that are out there, of course. Peptides is a good example of that. There was, there's a lot of data in mice that shows peptides can be helpful. Um, relatively little in humans for most of them. There's about a list of 20 that, um, that I'm aware of that are used by doctors. The majority of them now are, are banned by the FDA in the US. There are a few that are grandfathered in and still use. Um, you can, of course, still get them. There's still some doctors that, that find ways to find them or you can go offshore. But generally, I think that the way to look at peptides is that um, there are ones that are well-researched and well-studied. Um, I would direct you to um, the website pubmed.org um, and, and do some research on the peptides to see what comes up. The main reason for not doing them, besides the fact that especially some of them are not even available, is that there is evidence that they can cause body aches, uh, joint aches, which is indicative of an immune reaction. And uh, that is one serious concern of mine that you could invoke that with some of the peptides. Um, and I, I think that is an area that needs to be studied more. And um, so, you know, I, I'm giving you a general answer because there's a lot of nuances depending on the peptide, um, including one called, you know, MOTC, which is a peptide that um, I started a company, co-founded a company to work on, and it's looking promising in the clinic. It's M-O-T-S-C. Um, so, yeah, you know, I think that it will find out that some of them are beneficial, some of them are not, some of them are risky. Um, but it's hard right now to say definitively uh, which or where each of these falls. Great. Thank you. Shane Mann, I believe you have a question, my friend. Welcome. Will Wiseman, thank you so much for doing this. And uh, David Sinclair, absolute huge fan. Read your book. 
Um, I loved in the lifespan book, the story about your father at, you know, 78 or 80. And, you know, he, he, he started doing the things that you, that you proposed and he, and he got, and he just kept getting healthier. I mean, my mom at 78 is really struggling with aches and pains and, um, and just sort of dealing with life. Um, I wanted to ask you if you are, you know, someone, you, you know, moving towards elder age, like, you know, late seventies, what would be just, you know, the top three things you would recommend doing, uh, to help you, uh, deal with, you know, just this really fast aging, um, thing happening to you? Like what, like, you know, yeah. they, they're not willing to change. What would be three things you could suggest to them? Mm -hmm. Well, the first would be uh, to move. If you're not moving now, it's only going to get harder as you get older. And it's a, it's, a, it's a bad cycle to get in, not moving, and then you become frail and you can't move. So it's you know, my father, I'll keep giving him as a good example. Um, he started going to the gym and, and running in his uh, early 50s. So, you know, it, he started pretty early, so he was lucky that way. But there are enormous gains, uh, even for people in their 70s, to start moving. And it can be as simple as going for walks, um, standing up, stretching, um, even lifting light weights is something that, if it's possible, start doing it because it's only going to get harder the older you get if you don't maintain it and start make that a habit. Um, the other is uh, if, if uh, and I, I'm assuming we're talking about people who are in a healthy state um, and not frail. You know, it's very different if you already have a number of diseases then that's important to consult your doctor as to what your body can handle. But if you're in a relatively healthy state, um, it's not just moving, it's it's also looking at the type of foods you eat and when you eat. So I mentioned earlier that um, Serena Poon has advised, and I've, I've been very lucky to have converted to a plant-based diet. The rewards of that are just innumerable. Um, and so I would say that if, if your parents or grandparents are eating a Western diet that's full of inflammatory foods and processed foods, and if they're overweight, even worse, um, then steer them towards a, a much healthier diet, um, the kind of uh, diet that, um, that Serena advises. And you can you can look up her work. She's been talking about this for years, and I've only recently adopted it. Um, so that's it. And also, if the body can tolerate it, um, three large meals is, un is unnecessary for most people. And so my, what my father does is he skips breakfast and has a very small lunch and then has all these calories, most of his calories at night. Um, again, that's that's something that you should definitely start earlier in life. But I think in your 70s, if you're not frail, that's something to consider as well. But again, under uh, consultation with your doctor because everybody's different. Sorry, and, and, and what, what about taking in in, in, in a men or, or, or something? You, you, you wouldn't recommend that? Yeah. Well, I don't recommend anything, um, as I mentioned, but I, I, I've seen positive results in clinical trials of people in their 70s um, taking the doses I mentioned earlier. Now, we don't know the, the long-term safety. Uh, we don't know um, if it might stimulate uh, cancer. This is one possibility that people bring up. But I've seen no evidence for that. I think that the risk uh, is very low and the reward is potentially very high, so that's the personal choice that I make and my, I know friends and family make. Uh, so what would I say about that? I would say that um, do your reading um, or, you know, get your parents to read. Uh, my book is a good start. Um, there are papers that you can print out that are free on the internet. You can give those to the doctor and, and have them weigh in. Uh, but what I find is with clients and with family, um, and people around me, my circles, uh, NMN has been proven, or at, at least is, is seemingly beneficial in terms of mental uh, and physical health. Um, that's being borne out in my lab um, and in clinical studies. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's a good option. And it's also one of the, the few safe molecules, apparently safe molecules out there, um, because it, it's actually natural. And the levels, what we're trying to do is just replace what's been lost in terms of its synthesis with age, as I, I mentioned earlier. Great. 
Thank you so much for the questions. Uh, I think on that note, uh, we've got a ton of other questions, so I apologize to folks that we're not getting uh, getting to all of these. David, I want to thank you so much for joining us today and for what was really just a, a terrifically uh, insightful conversation, and and also want to thank you for all the the work that that you were doing and and for spending time with us. So thank you so much for being here. Thanks for inviting me, Will. It's good thank to see you. you. And thank you to the Kitty Hawk community for being with us here today. Much appreciated. Great to see you all. Great questions. And uh, look forward to connecting with you all soon. Have a great day.